Open your Bibles with me to the book of Galatians. For the last time. No, hopefully not for the last time, but for the last time as we preach through the book of Galatians. Now, two weeks today, we're going to come back to it for a particular message that I am looking forward to preaching because it did not come in the usual way. It did not come in the sense that it's the next section of Scripture to be preached on. It did not come in the sense that I have studied and prepared myself to preach it. Let me just kind of give you a heads up on it just a little bit. When we were at the men's conference, we had a guy by the name of John, I want to say Styles, that's not right, John Shields. Um, he is uh, really in charge of strengthening preachers and strengthening ministers in our state convention. And he lives in Lincoln, Nebraska now. For 25 years, he served a church out in western Nebraska. And uh, a tremendous job out there. John spoke to us very simply, but as he got prepared to do so, he did an exercise which I want to begin today with you. I want you to think of a verse. Hopefully you know a verse in the Bible. And uh, no, 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 not Jesus wept, okay? <laughs> All right, no, not that one. Uh, it could be something simple like John 3, 16, Romans 5, 8, uh, whatever. Whatever verse that you might know, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to take one minute. And I don't want you to close your eyes necessarily, but you can look down. You can, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about that verse. And I want you to ask God to speak to you from that verse. Ready? Go. Okay. The question is now, what did God say to you? Not what did the verse mean? Not what did it say in the Greek or the Hebrew? Or what did it mean in its context? But out of that one verse, and not what did that verse mean to you, but what did God say to you? Because you see, that's what I have asked God to do two weeks from today. When I am standing in this pulpit and I will preach again out of Galatians. But today I just went over there and I thought about Galatians 6.14, which is where I'm preaching from today. So open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Let's read verses 12 through 18 and then we'll come back to verse 14. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly now, there's a context here, but let me ask you this. Is that your point of life? Is that what you want to do? You want people to look at you? Do you want to be the center of attention? Do you want to make a, a good impression? Do you want to be the photogenic couple? <laughs> Thank you, brother. That was a good illustration. <laughs> You know, our lives, we make so much of this world and so much of this life about ourselves. I know somebody, who I won't say who it is, who bought a new car this week. It was their dream car, their bucket list car, and God had provided for that bucket list car. And it was a 2024 
last of the production of the Corvette Stingray that they ordered according to their individual package request. Certain suspension, certain engine, certain body, you know, everything was just the way they ordered it. Sent me a picture. Look what I got. Nothing wrong with that. I think it's great when God can, can bless you that way. And I, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think it's wonderful. But do we do that for ourselves? Or do we do it to impress others? Are we always so concerned about what others think about us? Now, of course, Paul is talking to the Judaizers who wanted to make a Jew out of everybody. They were more interested in getting the credit, getting a, a notch on their gun, if you will. They, they, they didn't care about the people. They just wanted another, well, let's do it like a pastor does. They wanted another member. They wanted another baptism. They wanted another thing to brag about at the next pastor's meeting. Listen to this. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. You know, there's always people around that are wanting to use us and make us one of their good impressions. And he says the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Because you see, they're, they're to the Jews... The, the cross was a real stumbling block. It was an offense. And so they, they, they didn't want to, they, they said, look, you know, we, we want to compromise. We, we want to make you Christians, Jews, so you're not quite so, what's the word I'm looking for here? You, you, you just not, we don't want to be in a conflict because of you. You know, we live in a day in which It's really hard to be a Christian and getting harder all the time. We don't want to be persecuted. Verse 13, not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. Then what he says in verse 14, this is the key verse, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and die to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God, even to those that demand that you be circumcised. Now finally, let no one cause me trouble. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And then he closes Galatians the way he closes every one of his letters. Every one of his letters, he closes with grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. This is called his standard complimentary clause or his valediction. You know, what's a valediction? What's a compliment of cross? You know, you write a letter, right? You write a letter and you say love or sincerely or with, with regards or prayerfully, respectfully, cordially, yours, yours truly, all that kind of thing. What does he close with? He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you or be with your spirit. That's not only every letter that he wrote, but also the letter to the Hebrews. The book of Hebrews closes with the same. That's why some people think that Paul may have even written or had a hand in writing the book of Hebrews. Because it ends the same way. Where would we be without the grace of God? Where would we be without the grace of Jesus Christ? When you take the entire Bible, it all boils down to grace. God's acceptance of us. God's provision for us. We don't deserve any of it. And where is that grace best Demonstrated. Where is it best illustrated? On the cross. And that's why he says, look at me again in verse uh, 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I want you to notice the individual words. First of all, our. Everybody say our. 
Are you included in that? Are you included in that community of faith? Our, the head of the church, our Savior. Let me ask you, is he? Is he your Savior? And then the word, look at the word Lord. Everybody say Lord. Lord. The King of Kings. The ruler of our life. The captain of our soul. Is he your Lord? And then the word Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. His humanity. His humility. His identification with us. Let me read Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Look at verse 18. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus, the child born, the son given. The lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. His birth announced by angels. Prophesied of old. Yeshua whose name means salvation, the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then that word Christ, everybody say Christ. Christ. Christos, the Messiah, the anointed one, the divine Son of God. Let me go back before that in verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross. Everybody say the cross. cross. Now here's the question. What does the cross mean? What does the cross do? Very early in my time with you as your pastor, I presented to you a message, what does the cross mean? I'm not re-preaching that message, by the way. I'm not going to do that to you. I, hopefully you don't need it repeated. Hopefully, but, but let, me, let me just give you an idea here. Go ahead and ask yourself that question. What does the cross mean? And if you, somebody asked you what it meant, how, what would you tell them? If you had to center in on a, on, on, a, on, a, on a verse of scripture or you had to, to, to explain to somebody what the cross means, could you tell them what the cross means? But for you and me and everybody else, here's another question. What does the cross do? Well, look at verses 12 and 13. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. And the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. Number one, what does the cross do? The cross condemns living in the flesh. Living in the sinful nature. But, but it's more than that. It's putting importance of the temporal things of this world above the eternal things of God. What do think, what, you think about a cross? What, what is, where, where do we see them? Where do we see them most commonly? We most so commonly see the cross in a cemetery. The cross marks graves. As a matter of fact, someone was talking about that on Fox News late last night. I just happened to see this. And I can't remember if it was Mark Levin or... Or somebody else, but they were coming about this. Something there was some kind of conflict about the cross, and people were were they were they were just offended by the cross. And he showed Arlington Cemetery, and you had row upon row upon row upon row of headstones, a few, very few, with the Star of David, and even few or less that you might have had the the. Uh, the, the moon and sickle thing, you know, the, 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 the symbol of Islam. But the majority of them had a cross on it. Now, these guys probably marked T for Protestant on their, on their enlistment forms, I don't know. And they may or may not have all been Christians. But the cross represents death. The cross represents judgment. But for us as believers, we don't think that way. We think the opposite of that. We think of it as the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. We think of the cross as life. But I want us as believers to think about it differently this morning. What does the cross do? It condemns the old life. And let me give you some specifics. Number one, the cross condemns vanity and pride. Matter of fact, there's even a song, one of our Christian songs. 
at Calvary. Yeah, and you know, I didn't even think about that when I wrote that down. And then it came to me, yeah, years I spent in vanity and pride. You see, and that's exactly what was going on up here in verse 12 and 13. Some live only to impress others, to have influence and acceptance. But they do not seek to be accepted by God. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the cross is, is about anything other than acceptance. The cross is about man's rejection of God and man's rejection of the Savior. They mocked Jesus. What does a cross do? It brings persecution. It doesn't bring acceptance. 1 John 2, 15 and 17 says this, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. The cross, the cross condemns vanity and pride. The cross does something else too. The cross is not convenient. You see, the cross condemns convenience. Living for yourself, living for comfort and control in life. We, we have a tendency in life to look for the easy things. We, want, we don't want to be bothered. We want, we want to be comfortable. We hate stress. We hate anxiety. And we elevate convenience above all else. We wish to avoid any discomfort or any disapproval of the crowd. And because we don't want the crowd's disapproval, we compromise and we seek to fit in. But the Bible, what does the cross do? The cross makes us separate. The cross makes us different. We don't, exceed, we don't seek the acceptance of the world. We seek the acceptance of God. Convenience. I wonder how many are not here today because it was inconvenient to be here. Let me tell you what, going to the Man Up Conference was not convenient. It really wasn't. It was weary. And it was tiresome. It was, you know, and there were parts I liked and parts I didn't like. I was really worried about it. Carlton going. I thought, oh man, you know, God, you're, you're going to give this 15 year old boy with a bunch of old men. He's going to be bored out of his brain. And he's not going to like it. And fun. it was great, wasn't it? Yeah. But I tell you what, it took three of us guys just to keep up with him. And even then, we were still, where'd Carlton go? You know. <laughs> and then that, that, that guy, that guy can control a basketball. His shooting is, eh, but boy, can he control a basketball. All right? And he could eat. <laughs> he had two plates every meal. He only served one. But he had a tendency to go back. You know, we need to pray for his parents. We may need to take an offering for them so they can feed him. But, you know, the convenience. We want everything to be easy. We want everything to be our way. You know, we go to the Walmart and say, Oh, Lord, give me a close parking place. You know? A cross condemns that. You think, matter of fact, I'm going to allude to this in a couple of weeks. Do you think Jesus just woke up and said, oh, it's Good Friday. Oh, it's good. I want to be crucified. Let me say, do you believe, any of you believe that Jesus wanted to die? Not convenient. The cross condemns hypocrisy. What does it say in verse 13? Not even those who, who are circumcised obey the law. Not even they are able to do it. Lifeless, changeless religion. And let me just simply say this. I know a lot of people say, I'm a Christian. Or I was baptized when I was eight. Or I was baptized when I was 14. Or, you know, whatever. I'm a Christian. Mommy and daddy were Christian. I go to church. I'm a Christian. But there's absolutely no fruit in their life. No proof at all. 
No change that took place. The cross condemns that. Faith without works is dead, being alone, the Bible says. There's no transformation, no power, no conviction of sin or condemnation. You know, one of the, fun, one of the things I often encounter when I share Christ with people is I will ask them, are you a sinner? And they'll look at me and they'll say no. And I have to kind of convince them, first of all, that they are. At least convince them that they're a liar. But once that conviction comes along, then they're ready for Christ. I've seen that again and again. The cross, what does the cross do? The cross condemns sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, which it's basically the gospel. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. If you're not a sinner, then Christ died for nothing. Christ died for our sins. That's how bad sin is. That's how much God hates sin. Then that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Hallelujah. Jesus said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Why? For sin. That whoever believes in him should not, shall not perish, but have eternal life. What's the consequence of sin? Perish. Eternal damnation. Verse 18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You see, the cross portrays both God's hatred of sin and his love of the sinners. That's hard for us to distinguish. But understand it this way. He makes a plain of Romans 5, 8. God commended or demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm, I'm, I'm more familiar with the King James. God commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the cross condemns life in the flesh. But number two, and this is where things turn a lot more positive, but yet still... It's actionable. It is something the cross does. It's something the cross does in me. It's something the cross does in you. Okay? The cross has a consequence. And we're going to be talking about that consequence in two weeks. But the cross has a consequence. Number, number one, the cross creates new life. New life. And... As part of that new life, number one, there's a new relationship with the world. Look at verse 14 and 15. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me. In other words, the world is dead to me. The world is dead to me, and I am dead to the world. Christian, is that not where our struggle is every day? Don't we struggle with the way the world thinks, the world acts? The world talks. I mean, we, we find ourselves thinking like them, acting like them, talking like them. <laughs> he says neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation, this new relationship with the world. And then I asked, some, I asked a while ago, I said, think of a verse. And somebody said 2 Corinthians 5.17. How appropriate. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. Everybody say gone. gone. Let me ask you this question. Is it gone? Are you still kind of struggling with that? Just kind of talk to the Lord about that. And say, Lord, I want it gone. You want it gone. So, Lord, let it be gone. The new has come. And you know what I love about the Greek there? The new has come. But it doesn't just mean it has come. It also means it's coming. It's coming. We talked about Abraham in Sunday school this morning. And, you know, God called him to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to a land. Then he went as far as Haran. Then God called him out of Haran and he said, no, you're not there yet. I want you to go to a land that I will show you. Oh, and by the way, later on, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And he waited and he waited and he waited and he waited. And finally, God gave him one son. And Abraham was still waiting. 
What, what does that mean? What, what am I talking about? Abraham was not fully grown in his faith when God called, called him to leave everything and everybody. He, along the road, grew in his faith and he was becoming a new creation. The old has gone, but the new is still coming. Let me ask you, if, if, are you stuck where you are? Or is there new coming? And are you open to the new? I want you to understand, Calvary Baptist Church, that we are in discussions right now. Just a couple of, uh, of your leaders are in discussion with Crosspoint. Crosspoint is going to plant a campus in McPherson this fall. The question is where and the question is how. I will let you know that when they plant their campus, they're going to start out with a congregation of about 150 people. Their leadership team met in our fellowship hall yesterday. We met with Eric Franklin, who's their executive pastor. He's over all their campuses and and a lot of the, the strategy and logistics of the way their church is continuing to grow and expand. And we met with him Wednesday, didn't we, Don? Now, there's going to be some logistical issues moving forward. And the question is, will that plant, will that new church, will it be launched in this location? That's the question. And if so, because understand something, what's the word he used? It's going to be very disruptive. Two congregations sharing the same building will be incredibly disruptive. There will have to be changes in schedules. There will have to be uh, some things working out financially, building, and all that kind of stuff. He was concerned about parking. I've already solved that problem, Don. I went out, so I spent time walking the parking lot. Anybody know how many parking spots we have? We have 47 parking spots. Now, according to the information I studied, you need two and a half to three parking spots, uh, or two and a half to three people equals one parking spot. Now, I walked our parking lot and looked at different things we could, that could be done, and we can handle comfortably 60 vehicles in our parking lot. That's putting 10 in the grass along this side over here. Now, that's just details, okay? But if they have 150 their first Sunday, they need 50 parking spots. We have 47. I've already figured it out. How it can be done? By the way, their young, their congregation, primarily younger people. You know what time they would have their worship service? Nine o'clock. So having a ten thirty or even ten forty five worship service, no problem. Now, how many chairs can you fit into this room? I want you to know that the blueprints and the layouts of this room allow for one hundred and forty people. But you can put more chairs than that legally in this room. This room was built for a max occupancy of 299. But you won't get 299 in here. But guess what I did discover? I went through the church and I counted every blue chair in the church. The ones back here, the ones here, the ones out there, the ones in a couple of rooms, and the ones in the fellowship hall. We have 200 blue chairs. It's just going to take some logistics. Now, I'm not saying that God wants us to do this. No, I'm not saying that because I don't know. But I will say to this, this to you, Calvary Baptist Church. When I came as your pastor 15 years ago, there were a lot of you. Well, there's not, some of you weren't even, most of you weren't even here then. But there were some of you that were wondering if Calvary would continue, if Calvary would continue to exist. And some of you that have been here for a long, long time, you're concerned. Will Calvary continue? I believe with all my heart that Calvary will. But I can offer you this assurance. If Calvary doesn't, there will be a Southern Baptist church in this building. Amen. Don't think of this as your building, Calvary. Think of this as God's building. Amen. 
Think of this as the church's building, not Calvary's. Not yours, not mine. Well, Pastor Dan, what does that mean for you? I don't know. That's part of what's exciting. It's scary at the same time. <laughs> this is exciting. And it's scary at the same time. There's so many examples I could, could give you of that. But we have a new relationship with the world. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Calvary, we've got to be prepared to renew our minds. A new relationship. Listen, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And I had several scriptures, and you can see them on the screen. We're not going to read them. We're going to move on. Number two, <clears throat> in creating a new life, it creates a new relationship with life. Verse 15. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. What does the cross do? What is this new relationship with life? When Jesus was upon the cross, there was a thief. There were two thieves there with him. And one of them said, Lord, remember me when you come into your, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, today, you will be with me. But notice also back in verse 15, it says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. You see, some things in our life become meaningless. Some of the things that used to mean something are now meaningless. Our values change. Our priorities are modified. Our allegiance is to someone greater than ourself. The Bible tells us to put on the new self. Luke 9, 23. In Luke 9, 23. Jesus said, if anyone would follow me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Matthew 10, 37 and 39. He says this. Got to skip here. Get to it. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We have a new relationship with life. And one of my core verses, one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5.15, says he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What does the cross do? Number three, the cross comforts the believer. 16 and 17. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. A couple of things. Number one, it speaks of the blessing of the cross. What is the blessing of the cross? Peace. What did Jesus say the very first thing on, on the cross? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It speaks of mercy. What did Jesus say from the cross? He said to the thief on the cross, he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. So it speaks of the blessing of the cross. And then number two, it secures, and this is a big one here, <clears throat> it secures our identity with Christ. Notice it says in that verse, excuse me, <clears throat> for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The Greek word there, and I know you've heard this probably somewhere before, the Greek word here is stigmata. Stigmata. We get our word stigma from it. Okay? In other words, ever, ever, you, something can happen in your life and it will leave a lasting impression, a lasting mark. It will be a stigma on your life. 
Another word for it would be scars. I want to talk about three different scars or marks that the cross does to us. Number one, there is the mark of suffering. The stigmata normally refers to the, the nail prints in Jesus' hands and the, the scar in his side, even the, the thorns, the thorn marks on his brow and the lashes upon his back. What did he tell Thomas? Do you remember what he told Thomas about a week or so after Easter? <clears throat> where Jesus came into the room where they all were, but Thomas had not been there. And then when Thomas was there, it says after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Then, he, then Jesus, of course, enters. And he said to Thomas, he said, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And boy, did Thomas believe. He bore that on his body. Not the marks of circumcision that the circumcisers wanted, but these were marks of suffering. Christian, what does the cross do? The cross enables you and I to bear marks of suffering. We're not to hide them from the crowd. We don't hide suffering as believers. Why do, I know some people are ashamed of suffering. They don't want people to know what's wrong with them. They don't, know what they're, they don't want people to know what they're struggling with. But as believers, we should show the marks of Jesus and say, Look, yes, I've had these scars in my life, but Jesus has saved me from these things. Jesus has delivered me from these things. Jesus is getting me through these things. <coughs> Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 11. And let me give you his scars. He bore on his body 195 stripes. <clears throat> Three times he was beaten with rods, which left fissures or stress fractures on his ribs and his arms and his back. One time he was pelted with stones, even left for dead. And that's why Paul could say, look, I, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I have been willing to suffer for Jesus. What does the cross do? The cross enables me and you to suffer for Jesus. Now, what does that mean? It's, it's not talking about, well, I think I'll get to that. I'm about to run ahead here. But it's, it's, it's not about just generally suffering. But it's when we suffer for Him or we suffer for someone else. There's Matthew 5, 10 through 12, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. So many verses, but let's move on. And then there's the mark of serving. Serving. Those who served in the Roman legions were tattooed with symbols and four letters. S-P-Q-R. Stood for Senatus Populus K Romanus, the Senate and people of Rome. 2 Corinthians 5 14 and 15 says this. We've already read 2 Corinthians 15, but let me read 14 and 15. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, no longer live for themselves. But for him who died for them and was raised again, we are to bear on our body the scars of serving Jesus Christ and serving others in his name. And then there's the mark of ownership. It's also a mark of ownership. The bond slaves would bind themselves over to their masters even after their master had freed them by having their body marked or bored with a symbol of ownership. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20 says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. 
Therefore, honor God with your body. And then finally, what does the cross do? The cross conquers. The cross conquers. Verse 18 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. The grace. Listen, we don't, we don't conquer with, with faith. We don't, we don't necessarily we don't, we don't conquer with, 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 with churches. We don't, we don't conquer with our own strength, with our personalities. Uh, our, you know, what conquers the world? What conquers evil? Grace. Jesus conquered hell, death, sin, and the grave. And in so doing, he purchased salvation for our souls. Romans chapter 8, 31 and 37 says this. I had to skip a lot of scripture. I've had a lot. But Romans 8, 31, 37 says this. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us. And by the way, that word if in the Greek actually means since. Since God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously, there's that word grace, graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns Christ Jesus who died? More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. He is our attorney. He is our advocate arguing for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than, what's the word? Conquerors. Through him who loved us us. When Jesus breathed his last upon the cross, he said, it is finished. It's done. And he wasn't talking about his life. He was talking about the work that he came to do. He was talking the payment that he would make for your sins and mine. Basically, the word finished or to tell us that means paid in full. Many years following, there was a war between the eastern and western parts of the Roman Empire. And there was a guy by the name of Constantine who was vying to be emperor. Eusebius, one of the early church fathers and church historian, writes about Constantine and says, as they were getting ready to go into battle, he had prayed that God would give him a sign. And he looked in the sky and there was the sign of the cross not one that looks like this it was a Greek cross and he heard a voice say in hoc signo vinces in hoc vino vinces actually he heard it in Latin which was in tuto vica in this victorious or in this sign, conquer. In the cross. In the cross. That's why we boast. Because there's nothing else that saves us. There is nothing else that gives us eternal life. There is nothing else that can enable us to endure in this life. And more than endure in this life, be victorious in this life. Now you hear people say, don't let life get you down. Amen. Don't let it get you down. If it gets you down, get up. And if you say, I can't get up, then just simply say, God, help me up. And he will. In the cross, we are victorious. Galatians 6.14. One more time. May I never boast except in the cross. May I never boast about the Kansas City Chiefs. 
May I never boast about going to this conference or going even to Winter Jam. May I never boast about how much money I make or how good my children are or how good looking somebody might be. Let the world boast about those things. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and to the world. In another place the Bible says, this is the faith that overcomes the world. This is, this is what overcomes the world. Even our faith. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand.